Welcome to Afros and Audio's Black History Month interview series. My name is Talib Jasir, founder and CEO of Afros and Audio Podcast Festival and the Vanguard Podcast Network. I'm excited to spotlight 29 outstanding indie podcast creators and professionals who answer the call to be a part of this series. My guest today is Cardera Johnson. Welcome and thank you for being here. How are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm glad to be here, man. Really glad to be here. Cordero, could you tell us about your journey into podcasting and the inception of the Awakened Soul podcast? Yeah, so my journey into podcasting is is a funny one because uh, for those that don't know, like I'm a super introverted and quiet person in real life. Um, And so there was a sports podcast. I used to have, I used to do a live show every weekend uh, and I would call in. And then one time the guy was like, hey, my co-host is out. Would you mind staying on? And then afterwards, he was just like, hey, man, you're really good at this. You should consider doing it. And so uh, then I did a sports podcast for a little while. That's how I, I got started. I learned, like, audio editing and everything like that. I did that for about two years. And then I decided, like, hey, I want to do something more meaningful. I've learned these skills now. I have to do something that's more meaningful because, like, just doing surface-level stuff doesn't really fulfill me. And so that's where the Awakened Soul came to mind. I wanted to talk about mental health. I wanted to talk about activism. I wanted to talk about my culture, music, everything. And so... Uh, I came up with the name because, like, people hear the awakened soul, they think it means to be woke. It has nothing to do with that. Like, to awaken means to enlighten, and then the soul part comes because I feel like when you connect with somebody, whether creatively or anything, it's a spiritual thing. Like, we're connecting on a soulful level. And so that's where that name came from. And so um, that's how I got started into it, and I've never looked back. It's been the, the greatest journey I could have ever gotten on, to be honest with you. All right. As they say, the rest is history. So what inspired you to focus on all those topics you just talked about, music, movies, media, social, social issues in your podcast? And how do you think your podcast has evolved in terms of content and approach? So I wanted to talk about those things because that's what makes up our culture. And that's one of the things I wanted to do with the Awakened Soul is like to highlight how our culture is rooted in everything that is American culture in a lot of ways, like everything was taken from us, the music, uh, like the infrastructure, everything that we've built. And so I feel like all of those things have their own place and they're representative of our culture in different ways. And I think if you look at like how music and movies and things have grown over the time and decades, it really is reflective of where our culture were were at that times in a lot of ways. So that's how I got started in wanting to talk about those things. And as far as how it's evolved, the content, I think I've evolved, like not just as like a host, but as a person. And so in wanting to talk about these things, I've educated myself, I've educated other people, and I feel like I've grown as a human and I've grown as an individual. And so whereas it used to be like this kind of more of a review type thing with the Awakened Soul, I think now we dig deeper and we get to like the root of like how it's reflective. And that's the thing that makes it special to me. And so I think The way that I deliver it has evolved just because I speak better about it now, where it was kind of just straightforward. Like I I can set up that story better and I I can paint the scene and the picture better now. And so like when people do listen to it, they really feel full based off what I've what I present. And that really makes me happy. That's awesome, man. And whenever I hear we I know right away we have some people to shout out. So let's do that first. Yeah, I mean, as far as like shouting out, I'm a solo host, but I won't lie and say that it's still like my mom, like, right? Because I talk to my mom all the time about the show. Like me and my mom talk about like, she'll listen to the show with her friends and she's learned things about me and how like I viewed how I was raised and things like that. And so I, I, I the show is basically me all from start to finish, but I have guests on. And so I want to shout out like Rome I and mean, I want to shout out JB, who's one of my best friends and AJ. So like those people who like we bounce ideas off each other, but they've also been along this journey and really have come on, been able to have deep and, and interesting conversations and any guest that's happened for that matter over the, the four years I've been doing this show. Because when, when you're a guest on The Awakened Soul, we get deep. And so I, I, I have to uh, thank everybody who along that journey has been willing to do that because there's been some people who I, I didn't know before they became a guest on the show, but they've never hesitated to really allow themselves to open up. And through that, we're breaking down chains and breaking down barriers. And I really appreciate that. That's what's up, man. I love that. So your podcast covers a range of social issues. How do you decide which topics to tackle and what's your approach to ensuring a balanced discussion? So I do my research on any guest first. I do my research on any topic. So I I really sit there and look heavily. And I think the way that we strike balance well is that I try to always go into things and talk about both sides of it. So regardless of where my own personal opinion falls on the topic, I also always want to present the counterpoint because I I truly feel that 
to understand and to agree are different. And I think that really helps break down the barriers of us being able to have more free flowing conversations when you can come to a place and say, Hey, I may not agree with how you view it, but I understand where you're viewing. And I want to gain that understanding, even if we, if I don't agree with what your view is. And I think that really helps uh, open those floodgates and allows people to feel more comfortable. And I think that's one of the things that when I talked about earlier, how like I've grown as a person, that's one of those ways is because to be able to look at something and say, maybe I don't agree, but I really want to understand where they're coming from. I really want to understand and add to my own knowledge and um, and through that journey of my own personal uh, growth in that area, hopefully I'm able to help other people realize that too, that you don't have to agree to understand where somebody's coming from. And hopefully that helps people. Yeah, absolutely, man. And as far as you've been in this for four years, was there a catalyst for you saying, you know what, I want to take a different approach. I want to take a little bit more time with these topics or do a little bit more research. Was it an intuitive thing for you or was it a audio, was it feedback that you were getting? How did that come about for you? I think it was a more intuitive thing just because I'm somebody who I, I read everything. I look at everything. So I always have this search for knowledge, but then there was one particular series that I did that it kind of really made me realize like I got to sit back and be in a place of trying to understand even better. So I did a, a series on um, deconstructing transphobia. And so like, I had never at that point in my time had sat down and had a conversation with a trans person and like what they go through, how they view things and educate myself. And so like, that was one of those series that it, it pushed me because I'd never done that. And I won't lie and say, there's a period of my life where I could have been looked at as homophobic or transphobic. And so that's not where I am at all anymore. And so being able to be in a place where I can admit that like, hey, I had some things that I had to grow through, some things that my way of thinking was trash to be 100% honest. And through just the natural search of wanting to understand, it put me in a situation to have a conversation with people that I had never gotten to or never even been in a place to sit down and realize, let me hear what they're going through, what their journey is like. Because again, if my culture is going to re be representative of our culture, everybody from that culture has to have their voice and black culture is everything. And so uh, that was one of those series. And that was probably like a year into me doing podcasts and that it really put me in a place where I had to su shut up, sit down and listen. And I learned a lot through doing that. Man, I love that. I love that because it's really evident on social media and conversations when someone is so resistant to someone else's experience mm -hmm. that they have never, ever talked to a person with that experience in their entire life <laughs> and have this aversion and this phobia. And it's like, maybe talk to someone, maybe open up, maybe have a conversation that will enlighten you versus yeah. just your thoughts and opinions, because your thoughts and opinions mean nothing to someone who's actually having a, a human experience. Right. Yeah. And so I love that you did that. And and something else that came up for me in doing that in, in doing that work and being early on, how come you weren't afraid that this would ostracize your fan base, your audience, because it's a beautiful thing that you weren't. Honestly, I think just the fact that like my podcasting has to be personal first. Right. And so I think because I was in a place of realizing that it was just something I didn't know. There was something I was completely ignorant to. I had no awareness on. And so if I did get ostracized for it or judged for it, cool. There was a place where I would have been on the other side of that. And maybe I would have reacted that way to somebody doing that. And so maybe they can learn through that too, because like, if you respect me, which at that point, like many people, like, I love what you're doing for the culture, then if that's truly how you feel, and you've now gone through this journey of a year, year and a half of me doing this podcast, and you see something that maybe makes you a little bit like, hey, what is Hayes really doing here? Then listen, and maybe you can do that same journey that I did. So it was never a fear of that to me, because I think the personal journey that I was on there of, of becoming more aware, um, and like you said, learning from somebody else's experiences that isn't my experience that was worth more than any of that. So I never really, I never really considered that, to be honest with you. There was nothing I was really worried about. That's awesome. And it, it really is um, a testament to you in general and that you were creating for yourself first. That's important because a lot of people approach their work, their podcast, their art, considering the audience first. And that is never a recipe for longevity and success, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah, especially when it's not coming from the heart, when it's not coming from you, you, you're just consistently creating for the outside world. So it has allowed you to grow and that's amazing, man. So kudos to you for being that brave. Some of us are brave, man. And, and some of us aren't. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's yes, 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 absolutely. So 
you talked about how Awakened Soul has helped you grow as a person. How has it helped you grow as a speaker? Oh, man, so much. I did my first live show podcasting. At this point, it was like six months before the pandemic. And I almost panicked when I got out. Matter of fact, when I spoke at the first Afros and audios, I was so nervous leading up to that. And it's called growing pains for a reason, right? And so, like, I was so in my box of introvertedness that I'd never even thought and contemplated talking about things that matter to me and my culture in a public space. And then through my love of doing that, it putting me in that position that is like, okay, well, what's more important? Is your fear of talking publicly more important than this message that you truly feel like you have to deliver? And I think that having that moment was what got me over it. And so now I'm in a place now where like, I can hop on this with you. I'm not worried about it. Somebody can ask me like, hey, I need you to speak in a conference with 200 people. I'm, okay, cool. I'll just let me get my topics together. So I've definitely grown as an ability to communicate my thoughts, but also to communicate my thoughts, I think in a way that people can understand uh, and see me working through that and setting that up. And that's not something I've really ever been in a position before I started podcasting. I have podcasting almost solely to thank for that. Yeah, man. I love that. I love that. A lot of us, and including me, a lot of people can see and think one thing, yeah. <laughs> but it is completely, we up in here. Yeah. And it's a stretch, man. The more you stretch it, the more you flex it, the better you are. And it takes that, doing it, right? Getting off the sidelines, getting in the game. That's how it unfolds. So I love that for you, man. I love that story. So you've been running this podcast since 2017. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Well, it's yeah. been a long time. Long. <laughs> so what advice would you give the podcasters on maintaining relevance and keeping content fresh over the years? The, the thing that I always tell any podcaster that comes and hits me up is that do what you're truly passionate about, because if that's where you start at, you'll never feel burnt out. And that's truly where I am in this place is that if you do what you, whatever you feel like you can talk about, whatever you study, have a, a yearning to learn about, that's what you should be podcasting about. Don't try to do the thing that you think is going to be the thing that's going to get a lot of views early, that a lot of people want to hear, that you think is the easy content. Do it. Look inside first. And then when you do that, it makes this thing so rewarding. And that's the thing. And, and then stay consistent. Whether you set out to do it every week, whether you set out to do it every month, or you do it out three times a week. Whatever you set, stay consistent in that and hold yourself to that. Because just like you said, it's stressing that muscle. That's how you build your audience. That's how your audience feels and they can rely on you. And then another thing, don't be afraid to fail. Like you learn through failing sometimes and you're going to have that episode that you go back and look at and you think, hey, man, that wasn't really good, but you're going to learn from that. And I think sometimes we, as a culture, we feel like we have to be perfect. And if we don't, then people aren't going to rock with us. And I'm a testament to it. People will rock with you as long as you're genuine. That's the most important thing. Be genuine. And a lot of people are afraid to share their failures. Share those failures as well. And as long as that genuineness is there, people are really going to rock with you and that's going to attach them to you. So those are the things that I really say focus on. Word up, man. And I have another question, but this one's off the cuff because I noticed that really dope background that you have, right? Yeah. And I took time to curate my space for creativity, and I know that it has evolved. Talk about that process where you're growing inside of your podcast. You're mm -hmm. presenting different. This is how we do. Talk about that for yourself, the aesthetics of it all as well. For sure. I mean, when I started podcasting, it was before, like almost every now podcast has a video element. So when I started podcasting, it was just audio. I had no video. I had no concept or thought about doing video. And then I remember I bought a camera so that I could do clips. That was all I was initially was going to do was clips of the podcast to put on social media. And then that evolved to doing full episodes. And then it evolved from that to having a space where it helps my mental to create. Now, I've created the perfect space. Like, I have two sides to the studio. I have this side, and I have the other side as well. So I have that, which is the production and the recording side. And it really helps my thought process. So when I'm working through an episode, it really helps. And I think having a creative space that is indicative of you, it really helps those creative juices flow. But then that, for a presentation standpoint, and, and people think you got to spend a lot of money. You really don't. Uh, background is wallpaper I got from Home Depot. So like <laughs> just a, a little peek behind uh, baseball there. You always want to present something in a way that it captures the audience if you're going to do it. So like if you're going to do video, 
do it the best that you can at that time and then evolve because you'll find your recording space evolves with your presentation on how you're doing your show so like my show started very industrial with it was just a regular wall and then i threw some sound panels up there and now i have those are led lights they're not on right now so like it evolved in that way and it's also evolved in like what i wanted to do what i wanted to present and it's made it stay interesting for me because if you do something for this long and you do it daily or whatever it is you you need to stay invested you need to do things that are going to be challenges and interest to you and that's what this space has become for me that's awesome man and and you said it right evolving graduating allowing your, yourself to grow inside of it it's not as if you had the vision of the space when you started like yeah. allow it to unfold allow it to grow with you and it's to your earlier point a lot of people don't want to start until it's all right. Yeah. And that's how you never start, <laughs> period. You mentioned video. When did you start to become audio and video in your um, journey in podcasting? I was about two and a half, almost three years in before I started that. And like I said, it, it literally was just clips because at, at the time I was taking like the, the screen grab of me like playing the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever, and I was posting that to Instagram. So it would just be like the scrolling thing with like a one second clip. I was like, how can I make this different? Let me buy a camera. I, actually, my first camera I got in a pawn shop. I, I happened across it. It was 75 bucks. It was a Panasonic camera. I was like, cool, I'm, I'm off to the races. But then I learned what I could really do with video. And then I learned how like video can be used not just as like a thing for clips, but it can be used as a different way to connect with your audience. Because for some people, even though podcasting has become like norm in a lot of ways, for some people, regardless of how big that sect of the audience is, until they can see you, they never fully feel connected to you. So I look at, at video as an extended way to connect with my audience. So now you're seeing me, you're seeing me animated and, and talking with my hands. And even sometimes when I'm working through my thought and I look up to the left and I'm like, I'm thinking through it. Like for some people that makes them feel more connected to Cordero, the host, right? Not just the podcast. And I think that's the special part about videos that it gives them a window into you. And as you get more creative with no learning how to edit and stuff, you can add a little flair to that. But I think the biggest thing is that it's just another way for your audience to connect with you. And I truly feel like in podcasting, the topics, the whatever, the, the subject matter, that may get them in the door. But if you want them to keep coming back, they have to feel a connection to you. And so it's just another way to connect. That's great, man. And how do you engage with, with your listeners? I, so a lot of ways, I have a voicemail line. I always encourage people to call in with their thoughts and I'll play those in, on the episode, whether it's response to something that I said on the podcast or it's something separate. Email, of course, like I, I constantly reach out to me and email. But then now you have ways of like uh, on TikTok, like doing the live streams and things like that. And that's something that I've added in probably the last couple of years as well as like doing the occasional live stream where it's not necessarily a podcast topic, but hey, let's just hang out. Like, let's just hang out and let's talk. And then where the conversation naturally goes, we'll go from that. And so th those are ways. And then I feel like you got to get out and touch the people. So I like doing live shows. I like doing meetups, things like that. Sometimes I have to travel for work. So I'll turn that into opportunity to meet up with some of the people or listeners of my podcast. Say, hey, I'm, I'm here in Dallas for, for four days for work. Everybody want to meet up at a bar or do something like that just for that chance. So try to engage with them as much as possible in a lot of different avenues. And I feel like that because not everybody has that one-on-one -on -one or that ability to write, reach out and touch somebody, like I said before. So I try to do that as much as I can. That's awesome, man. You just gave a masterclass on how to be introverted and engage your audience at the same time. <laughs> and I'm the same way, introverted, extrovert to the people who know me, introverted to myself who knows me. And you are stepping out, like you're there, you're doing it. And it, it seems as if that intentionality around knowing that this is only going to support the bottom line. This is only going to support me as a creator. Keep me in it. Keep me locked in and grow and, and be able to scale this thing. So everything you've mentioned has all been scaling your podcast from day one to where you are now. And I think that's good information for, for people for to sure. understand and know. Yeah, sure. man. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Looking back over 370 episodes, that's a big fucking deal. <laughs> Can you share one of the most memorable moments or a particular challenge you faced during this journey? Yeah, I think there's a period of time where I was going through depression, a serious depression. I, I lost my little brother and I had to ask myself, like, 
do I even want to keep doing this? And that was nothing to do with podcasts. Podcasts was still great. And I remember I, I decided to do an episode and I literally just talked through my thoughts, th- talked through my feelings, what I was processing grief wise, ch- kind of explain people why there was like a large gap there for a little second in episodes. And when I tell you that that was one of the episodes that people reached out and they're like, hey, I lost my dad two years ago and I've still been trying to figure out how to put how I'm feeling into words and you just did it. And so that was one of those moments where it just reminded me, this is why I do this. And this is why I can't stop because I definitely thought about it. I'm in the middle of a hiatus now just because I went through a move and stuff like that. But that was one of those moments where it was like, I got to keep doing this, not just for me, but because of how it is truly helping people. And that was a barrier that I had to get over for a second. It's like, am I really touching people or am I just talking? And that was one of those moments where it reminded me of that. Like, no, I really am touching people no matter who it is. I don't care if nobody else heard that episode. The fact that it touched that one guy, that was enough for me to remember, like, I know I got to get back to this. That's great, man. And we are so glad that you got back to it. You mentioned in the submission that one of your biggest podcast wins to date was your three city live show tour. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit more about that. What made it successful? And if there were any challenges that you had to overcome, talk about that. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge that was the doubt that I had of myself, like, was anybody actually going to show up to see me, right? And and it's like a a bit of a hubris in it, like, are you coming to show up to see me? Like, so I think, but that came about because of... I wanted to do a live show and I knew I wanted, I had did a live show actually for one of my other shows, the breaks radio. And it, but there was three of us and it was kind of different. It was in my hometown in St. Louis. It was completely different. So, but that the three city live show tour, none of those were in cities that I live in. So it was a little bit different there. And I think up until the day of the first show, which it was in DC, we had sold maybe like a third of the, of the venue seating. And I had to come to the realization like, Hey, I don't care if five people show up. I'm literally going to act like I sold out Madison Square Garden. That's the show that I'm going to try to deliver for people once I got over my nerves. Uh, but then by time, an hour before the show, not only did we sell out the show, we had to go into the overflow where people had to stand in the back and watch on the TV. And so that was the moment because it didn't set out to be a tour. It set out for that one city. It was D.C. It was going to do that one show. And then from doing that show, it was like I had in the back of my mind, well, if this is successful, these are a couple other places I could do shows. And so I think getting over the fear again, because fear like public speaking is a big thing for me. And so getting over that, having that show go the way that it did. And by the end of that show, just the way that the crowd was so engaged and I had people that came up that literally people came off the street and they were saying, well, we were just walking. We saw all these black people going into this place. So we came in and we paid a ticket and we love your show. I'm going to listen every time now. So it just reminded me again, it was that reaffirmation of like, why I'm doing this in the way that the message can get across to people. Yeah, man. And I love that you just be jumping out there, man. (laughs) (laughs) Like literally that's how it goes down. Right. You know, when they say you got don't F around and find out, literally you have to, you must F around to find out. Like that's the only way in in which things work. (laughs) Right. That's the only way you find out. So I love that. And I love that this Testament of your journey, because a lot of people, again, man, just stay back. Yeah. Worrying about the how, worrying if people are going to show up, worrying if what you are doing is going to resonate or connect with people, but you will never know until you start the work. Yeah. Ever know until you start the work. Yeah. So that's really dope, man. How do you see the Wake and Soul contributing to the broader podcast community, especially in the context of like Black History Month and Black content? I think hopefully it adds to people to remember that our culture is everything and there's no reason to shy away from it. There's no reason to not talk about some of the ugly sides of it, the beautiful sides of it. It's everything. And so I think ultimately, like when somebody listens to the awakened soul and they go in, whether they do a deep dive or listen to one random episode that they feel like the topic is something that they're interested in, that you get something that's reflective of that culture and it bask in the love of what our culture is. And so that's something I could talk about my culture all day and whether it's the music, whether it's anything, I could talk about it all day. And so it's something that brightens my life up. And I hope that people just remember that, that what our ancestors, what everybody has gone through uh, to lead up to where we are, we are living in a lot of ways, the dreams of our ancestors. And so that's the message that I want to come through from the awakened soul of nothing else, man. That's great, man. And you mentioned it in the previous response, but can you talk a little bit about Breaks Media, how you started it, shout people out if you want to, and where it is uh, today? Yeah, Breaks Media started naturally, organically, like kind of like everything. So I started The Awakened Soul 
from that, we had other podcasts to spin off of, and, and usually it came from like having a really great episode uh, with someone, and then we kind of spun it off into its own show. So the Breaks Media has my sports podcast, which I back to doing sports, and then we have the Breaks Radio, which is just music, it's only talking about our music and the history of our music, and also some of the new uh, things with our music. And I do that with Baylor, Mary. Who uh, Mary works for Mass Appeal. She's worked for Hot 97 before. She's an amazing person in just the culture of hip hop music. She's amazing. She's worked hand in hand with Nas, LL Cool J. Like this woman has done everything, and she's such a amazing steward of hip hop music. And so the fact that I get to work with her every single week is amazing. And Marquis is another one. He's an artist himself. So we really have kind of the the music side all covered, and then the mental health aspect. I still work with Dark Sugar and stuff like that. So it's turned into this company that I really feel like whatever your flavor of is, we have something to represent that. And so um, that's what the breaks media is. I want it to be a network that is so black and beautiful. <laughs> and that's just really what it is, man. To just be frank, it's black and beautiful and it's us. man. That's great, man. That's great. So what future directions or new ideas do you have in store for awakened soul? So uh, the Wake and Soul it, it, at this point is getting back in gear, getting back to being weekly. Uh, I want to start another set of interview series where I'm interviewing people. I already got some things lined up. I got a really big interview that I'm super excited for, but it's 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 we're going to be breaking down um, like uh, the first series is going to be my favorite song. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to talk about people and what their favorite song is and the moment in their life that that makes them remember or, or something like that, why it's meaningful to them. And that's, again, just going back to, like, meaningfulness and, like, things in history from our culture. And then also more video. I'm actually getting into – I've worked on some short films already. I want to start getting once a quarter. I'm going to start releasing some type of short film, and that's kind of the next gear of where I'm at, heading to in 2024. Oh, that's pretty cool. We got to talk. I love that. <laughs> so where can listeners find more about Wake and Soul, Breaks Media, and stay updated with your um, latest episodes and the projects? Absolutely. So you can follow me at CEO Hayes. That's C-E-O-H-A-I-Z-E. That's the central hub. Everything that I do gets posted through there. You can follow the Awakened Soul at Awakened Soul Pod on every social media platform. And if you stay locked in with those two, you're going to find everything that we're going to do. We're on every podcasting app and platform, also on YouTube, the Awakened Soul. And you follow us, subscribe, all of those places, and you'll be tuned in with what we do. All right, man. And, and my final question is advice, man. You have given a lot of gems. I really appreciate it. And you are a network owner, a successful podcast host. You've done the live shows. What advice would you give to that aspiring podcast creator or network owner? What would you say to them? Remember what your goals are always. Do not let the the success or anything or lack thereof of success deter you from what your goal is. Set that goal uh, early. Know what you want to do and uh, and just, just follow it. Follow it. And it, through the ups and downs, there are going to be ups and downs in this as everything in life. And I can promise you it's well worth it on the other side. And then. If you go back to what I said earlier, do what you're passionate about. Let your passion guide you in this. And I swear it's going to take you further than you trying to chase what the hot topic is on social media or anything like that. Truly follow your passion, whatever that passion is. And if you follow that, I promise you it's going to be a reward on the other side of it. Absolutely, man. And same question for the veterans. You've been doing this for 2017. You're still passionate about it. Nobody can say that you aren't. It's obvious. What do you say to those veterans who are fitting to just put it down like this ain't this ain't it no more but they're just not thinking about it in a way that would support them to keep moving forward it's all about sustainability absolutely and that goes back to like doing your passion but also like make sure you put in your own challenges if something that you're doing you feel like it's no longer serving you sit down and go back to what originally got you started in doing it get back to the root of it sometimes we've got to get back to our roots i've gotten turned away and lost my focus at times because of success or whatever else or, or lack thereof like if you're a veteran and you've been in this for a while you're thinking about hanging it up just remember like you have to have fun in it first but then on the other side of that as well people are getting something out of this and you're truly touching people this is an opportunity to touch people that you weren't necessarily be able to touch in your everyday life and if that matters to you and you got into this for the right reasons don't hang it up because i i i i, I can attest to it because there's been podcasts that have helped me we really are helping people out there, man. 
Right on, man. Right on. Well, if there's nothing else that you want to say to the people, I'm going to close this out. Thank you. I hope you guys got a lot out of this, man. What Afros and Audio has been doing has just been beautiful, and I've been blessed to be there since the first Afros and Audio, man. And I just, to watch it grow to what it's been to, man, I, I got to commend you. You talked about it, me thank a lot you. on it, man. What you've built here is not something that I want to take time out to make sure that I thank you for what you've built because you've helped so many creators, whether you realize it or not, help find their journey in this, help rediscover their journey, and just introduce them to a new audience, man. And I thank you for that. Bro, thank you. I really appreciate that. It's a journey and we yeah. both know that, but we're still here and that's something yeah. to be said. So thank you, man. I really appreciate your time today. This conversation has been great. I'm glad that we were able to reconnect in this way. And I know that it's going to forward a lot of people. So thank you. I want to give a big thanks to our Afros and Audio and Black Podcasters Association members for supporting our commitment for community and collaboration. If you'd like to join the Black Podcast Association, the link will be in the description. And if you want to join us at the sixth annual Afros and Audio Podcast Festival, visit afrosandaudio.com. Follow at Afros and Audio on all social media channels, and you can find and follow me at Talib, Talib Jasir on Instagram. Thanks again, Cordero, for being a part of Afros and Audio's Black History Month interview series. It's been a pleasure, man. Thank you, man.